All right, welcome to our presentation on a robotic hand built with super coiled polymers. Our team includes Nathan Bennett, Corbin Bothell, Matt Brown, Radit Nopcharongwong, Justin Skamansky, and myself, Zach St. Clair. Um, this project is sponsored by Dr. Mascaro and is in conjunction with his biorobotics lab. It was first started by graduate student Matthew Paget, who developed the manufacturing system and characterized the various responses of uh, the SCPs. And then a senior project last year took it over, um, continuing his work and began to implement it into a robotic hand. And now you might be asking yourself, what is a supercoiled polymer and are they really that super? Well, a supercoiled polymer or SCP as they will be referenced throughout this presentation is a muscle-like actuator that is made from twisting a polymer until a tight helical coil is formed. They can then be heated with electrical power to contract and can exhibit upwards of 20% strain or sometimes greater depending on the type. The high power to weight ratio, controllability, simplicity of manufacturing, and the extremely low cost of construction makes these actuators very attractive for industry. To showcase this technology, we have built a robotic hand that features electrical heating, a circulatory water system, and sensing. The goal for the second iteration of this senior design project is to implement feedback control into the hand as well as improve upon the water cooling. Now Justin's going to tell you a little bit more about how we made SCPs and how they relate to our project directly. Yeah, so the SCPs that we made were done by wrapping copper wire around a nylon fishing line. And then the nylon was twisted until it formed a nice tight coil. After which we heated the SCPs at about 170 degrees Celsius. This allowed it or made it so that when we release tension on the SCP that it would hold its its current shape. Um, the, all of our SCPs were made using a manufacturing apparatus that was designed previously by a former grad student here at the U. And by sending an electrical current through the copper wire, we were able to heat up the the nylon fishing line, causing it to contract. And this contraction gives us actuation similar to that of a human muscle. After we had a few SCPs created, we went about testing them. We had an, a test set up so that the SCPs would be held up in a vertical position, and then we could apply a mass load to the, to the end of it and test the contraction of each SCP. From doing this, we tried testing it by varying voltages and also by varying load. From, or by varying voltages, we found that the higher the voltage, the, uh, we could reduce the response time needed. And after we found a voltage that correlated very well with the, our desired response time, we were able to test different masses. And from that, we found that the load had no response or no connection to the response time of the SCP, but also that we were able to or to achieve the 20% strain regardless mm -hmm. of the load that we had applied. Um, and after performing these tests, we found that we needed a more in-depth look at the heating of the SCPs. It looks like this is the section Nate was going to take over with, but he's experiencing some computer yeah, problems. he just texted us. Um, so moving forward, um, Nate did a thermal analysis on the um, system. So what he did is um, he did a CFD analysis um, in, in um, SolidWorks as well as in Annex um, as far as um, to, anal or to analyze the um, heating properties and cooling properties of the different subsystem in there. Um, I don't know the individual now. details so, like, oh, you're back? Perfect. Yeah, sorry about that. I was having some slight computer issues. 
So as Matt was saying, I ran a couple different simulations for the SCPs under a couple different uh, circumstances. That way we could better understand how they would respond during heating and during cooling. I did a transient thermal analysis using Abacus with simplified geometry. This made the model a lot easier to run. Uh, and we assumed that the nylon fishing line had uh, similar properties to nylon 6.6. Uh, we ran two simulations, one for heating and one for cooling. Uh, we calculated the heat transfer coefficients for these, uh, for these simulations. And from these simulations, we learned that when we put the SCPs in water, it needed a lot more power to heat, about 16 volts or 128 watts, given the resistance of the SCPs. Uh, for cooling, we found that we needed about a quarter liter per minute to get the cooling response time that we desired. Uh, that's all we really have for supercoiled polymers. And next, we're going to talk about the hand model. OK. So to showcase this SCP, we wanted to improve on last year's hand model. Um, last year's design worked by having fishing line attached to the SCP, where the SCP was in the forearm, and then fishing line, extra fishing line, which attached to the SCP to the tip of the finger. Um, they also had uh, external springs that attached from the tip of the finger to the back of the hand. So. <clears throat> by heating up the SCP, the fingers would contract, and then after the SCPs were done contracting, the external springs would pull the fingers back to its original or uh, natural position. Um, their hand, they used, for their hand, they used 3D printed fingers, and which were held together by rods, which were re relatively fragile, and they were complicated. Um, and also, they used the external springs. So, for our goals, we wanted to streamline this model, and we also wanted to add support for feedback control. So for our design, we used um, flexible plastic, or in our, in our case, we used NinjaFlex. Um, the hand was designed so that it would be printed where the fingers would uh, be hyperextended, so that when they were strung up, they would want to return to like the natural hand position. Um, so then the goal would be for the SCPs to contract the fingers and then the, the hand itself would pull back. So in our first iteration, we had, we printed the full hand and we found that this took really long. And if the prints fail, we had to start over. So in the second iteration, you can kind of see in the picture, the palm is made out of PLA where it's white. And then the fingers were made out of Ninja Flex, which is the red parts in that. Yeah picture. Um, this was a great design choice or a change because we could also make, when we needed to make changes to the fingers, we could do so without printing the whole hand. And this also made it more modular where if the fingers were to break, we could replace them. Um, however, in the second iteration, when we strung it up with the SCPs and the water tubing, we found that uh, the joints were not strong enough to pull the SCP or to pull back after the SCPs were done cooling or done heating. So we made a third iteration where we um, made the joints thicker and we also added the mounting holes for the Hall effect sensor. So the goals that we reached in this for the hand model in this year's uh, project was. Uh, the fingers are more durable and do, they do not need external springs. And we were also able to fit some type of sensor sensing to enable us to do feedback control. And Nate will talk more about the testing and calibration of the Hall effect sensor. So by using magnets and Hall effect sensors, we were able to um, uh, measure the angle between the palm and the first knuckle of our fingers. Uh, to do this, we first use an IIR filter or a moving average filter. That way we can get rid of, uh, rid of a lot of the noise that is natural with Hall effect sensors. Uh, but after this, we kind of run into a snag where the magnetic field wasn't strong enough. And the fix for this was actually rather simple. All we really had to do was align the magnetic poles. That way they were working together rather than against each other. 
and this gave us a magnetic field strong enough that we were able to get usable data from our all effect sensor. Once we were reading this data, we measured the angle and recorded the signal that we were record, uh, receiving from the Hall effect sensors. And we were able to use a second degree polynomial fit to get a function to give us our relative angle based off the signal. The reason why I used a uh, curve fit rather than uh, explicit function is because we are changing both the orientation and the distance of the Hall effect sensors from the magnets. And that makes it rather difficult to calculate uh, just like the physics behind that. So it was much easier for us just to use a curve fit. Uh, with this curve fit, we were always within five degrees of our estimated angle and the actual angle. And we had a very strong correlation coefficient or R squared value of 0.95. Uh, after this testing was, and this was the last thing we did before spring break. Uh, we would have liked to go more into feedback control, but because of the restrictions and not having not having access to the lab, we weren't able to use this uh, position feedback to implement our feedback control. Uh, the next sub system we will talk about is the water cooling system. So with our project here, um, one of the major requirements was that we incorporated um, the cooling system in our in our um, model. It had to be with water. Um, so we designed and built this water um, circulatory system and basically improved upon last year's design. Um, previous year um, faced issues with the fittings where the SCPs and the tubing separated. Um, and then as well as they faced issues with their tubing design itself. Um, with the issues with the fitting, um, where the SCP was strung through, it was strung through a quarter inch teat fitting. So the water would be directed down out of the fitting and the SCP would go straight through um, with just fishing line to connect it to the tether for the finger. Um, and then one end was sealed off so it didn't leak fluid out the end. Um, we found that those seals weren't always watertight and it did still cause some leaking. As well as we found another major issue was with the knots inside the fitting to get the SCP to the finger um, tether. It obstructed the flow of the water and caused the back pressure within the tube um, which caused it to balloon even more. Um, with the tube ballooning, um, that was a major issue they faced last year. Um, the reason why it's tube balloons and that we're making our own tubing um, is because we have to have a very flexible tube that, and there's no commercially available tubes available in that uh, meet our parameters and sizing and everything, as well as still being able to maintain the 20% strain. So that's why we're making custom printed or custom made tubing um, and it's all silicone molded. Um, so I'll kind of first talk about the differences we did with the um, fittings and then I'll go into the tube differences. Um, so first to improve on the fitting design, rather than that T-junction, we custom made our own elbow junction. Um, so the water would go through, the, um, through and down out the junction and then the SCP was secured inside this, the tube fitting junction with a screw. This made it easily accessible to swap out the SCP when needed um, if it burnt out or had any issues with that, as well as it served as our electrical connection to get power in and out of the SCP while completely enclosing the SCP inside the water circulatory system. This greatly reduced the leaking as well as it improved the water flow through the system as the SCP wasn't obstructing the flow um, through the system. And then for the tubing design, like I mentioned earlier, last year's faced major issues with the ballooning of the tubes. Their solution to this was they had um, purchased um, proprietary, just um, corrugated tubing that was rigid that went around their tubing. So when it did expand, it would make contact with that and would prevent it from further expansion or possibly rupture. Um, but also when it made contact with that, it restricted the linear uh, motion of the SCP because it was in contact with the rigid tubing. So to improve upon this, uh, we did a couple calculations about the pressure inside and then calculated the, what we would need for the thickness of the wall tubing uh, based off of the pressure. Um, so after we got that, we did a rapid prototyping approach towards improving the, pro the, um, the tubing designs. So we made multiple different designs and models in SOLIDWORKS as well as then um, we used those to make molds um, that we would 3D print 
and then using quick setting um, silicone epoxy, we would cast these tubes in a vacuum chamber. Um, the reason why it was in a vacuum chamber was to um, reduce the imperfections and bubbles inside the tubing, making it a more consistent tube. Um, and then we've tried many different geometries and improved upon different design iterations with this. Um, in the end, we decided that the helical design um, performed best based it off our test. So it's got a thicker ring of tubing material um, that's just a hel helical um, spiral around. This prevented the, the ballooning of the tube as best as we could um, with this. And overall, I was really satisfied with the solution to this um, issue that we faced, as well as the quality of the tubing. Um, and then we were continuing to make small iterations and changes uh, moving up to spring break. But after spring break, we weren't able to access the vacuum chamber to continue the manufacturing process. So we decided to take a step back and look at a different approach to the tubing to see where future um, improvements could be made. And this is where we decided to do a finite element analysis, which Corbin will discuss in greater detail. Thanks, Matt. Um, so like, you, like Matt said, we had done most of our experimenting with the tubing all in the physical setting. We didn't do much FEA before spring break. Um, after spring break, though, we went and took the model that we had determined functioned best and put that into SOLIDWORKS to run um, FEA on. Um, we put on the FEA model, we had an internal pressure within the tube to simulate the internal pressure that would come from the pump or any resistance that the water faced as it traveled through the system, as well as we applied an axial load. Those are represented by those purple arrows that are pointing away from the tubing to the tube. We did that because we found that experimentally, in order to get the SCPs to contract properly, they had to be pre-loaded to a certain desired stress, so that way they had the ability to contract. Um, so we threw on the, that pre-load onto the tubes because they would experience that as well as the internal pressure. Um, because we were using a quick setting silicone, it was hard to determine the exact material parameters, and so we ran the model on a very similar silicone. Um, and from that model, we found that because of that axial load, it actually prevented a lot of the ballooning that it was experienced in previous years' um, project, as well as if we removed that axial load, those, that spiral ring structure prevented the, the tube from ballooning. And then as we played around with values, we were able to increase our a safety factor on these to ensure that this design was adequate, and we were able to validate the results that we were able to obtain experimentally from our FEA model. Um, moving forward, we have the our, we can look at our critical function table that's in the bottom middle of our poster here, um, and these are our goals that we set at the beginning of the semester for things we wanted to accomplish at our during our project. We wanted uh, the strain of our SCPs to reach 20%. Um, in actuality, we were able to get our, our SCPs to strain to 15% for an intermittent amount of times. So we were able to get that to function many, many times over again. We were able to get 20% strain. However, when we did that, we would end up with results where um, it would melt the fishing line and ultimately cause that SCP to become unusable. Um, we also had time limits we wanted for contraction and expansion. Um, our goal was to have both of those less than three seconds at the beginning of the semester. And throughout the semester, we were seeing drastic drops in that time frame. And so right before spring break, we had a contraction response time of five seconds and an expansion response time of four seconds. And we imagine that if we were, had the ability to continue working in the lab with um, the resources we have there, we would have been able to get those to their desired values. As well as with that input feedback control, um, our original goal was to have the angle accuracy be within 10 degrees. And as Nate mentioned, we have an angle accuracy of five degrees. And we would have, if we had the ability to, um, that would have been very valuable in implementing that into our feedback control. And with that, we can have Zach cover the conclusion. Awesome. Thanks, Corbin. Um, so as we've kind of discussed, our finished prototype was not quite as complete as we would have liked. Um, however, all subsystems did come together as planned. 
And overall, we feel that we are leaving the project in a, in a pretty good place, um, despite response times being slow for the actuation and the cooling system needing some assistance and some more fine tuning with uh, how those hands or finger joints pull back. Um, we were on the verge of making major progress in uh, completing and finalizing uh, our functions um, for movement. <clears throat> With more time um, in different circumstances, uh, we could have calibrated the actuation more precisely to increase the contraction and to improve that response time. Um, and then with that being done um, and having more defined movement, we would have easily been able to implement the feedback control um, given that data from our Hall effect sensors. Uh, additionally, you see in this picture up here that we only have three completed fingers. Um, we were really trying to dial in just one finger before moving on to uh, finishing all five tendons and fingers. Um, so that's why our picture looks slightly incomplete up there. Um, so given the termination of group meetings and constructions, uh, our ability to focus on software analysis did leave us with a much better understanding of the physical model, um, as well as affirm that we were on the right track to completing our prototype. So we did have some really good takeaways from that thermal analysis as well as the FEA analysis. Um, and that's all we have. Thank you for listening. And we'd now like to open it up to the audience for questions.